one of the important concepts about strain hardening and this dislocation slip process is the idea that many of the processes that we use to shape metals are done at room temperature, or at least not far from room temperature, and as we'll see later, uh, it, that particular temperature issue is an important one. We call this cold work because of the fact that it is done at a relatively moderate temperature. And what it means is that in any of these processes, we're plastically deforming the metal in such a way that we generate dislocations and entangle those dislocations as they move and thereby cause strain hardening. And so whether we're forging or rolling or drawing or extruding a sample, we're typically changing the cross-sectional area, causing it to be smaller, often increasing the length of the sample, and in the process causing plastic deformation and strain hardening of the material. And the way that's usually characterized quantitatively in practice is by a property or a uh, parameter known as cold work or percent cold work represented as percent CW typically and it's simply calculated as the percentage reduction in cross-sectional area that's caused by the plastic deformation process. And so often uh, properties of various metals are cataloged or graphed as a function of the percentage cold work for that material uh, so that it can be used by engineers during design to determine how much, for example, the yield strength will go up or ductility will go down as a result of a particular amount of cold work. And of course you yourself are going to make exactly these sorts of quantitative measurements uh, during your brass lab experiment. So as an example, we see here uh, these graphs from the Callister text that show how the yield strength and ductility varies as a function of percent cold work for several different types of metallic samples, steel, brass, and copper. And of course, as we'd expect, the yield strength increases and the ductility decreases as the amount of cold work goes up. Now, in terms of how we might use graphs like this in order to perform a percent cold work analysis, let's consider that we receive a copper sample from a manufacturer in a state of 50% cold work and a cross-sectional area of 4 square millimeters. And let's suppose that we're interested in knowing what its approximate yield strength and ductility is at this point. We could then take a look at our property correlation graphs. And we'll note that if we go to 50% cold work, we go up to the copper curve, and then come across, we would have a yield strength of about 340 megapascals. And similarly, on the ductility curve, about 4% elongation. Next, we might ask, if we were to take this sample and cold work it further, down to a cross-section of 2 square millimeters, what would be its new yield strength and ductility? Now we might be tempted, based on the formula for cold work, to calculate the amount of cold work for this second cold work process. And remember, cold work is just the original cross-sectional area minus the new deformed cross-sectional area over the original, in other words, the percent reduction. And so in this case, we could take the value 4 square millimeters minus 2 square millimeters divided by the original 4, or in other words, 50% cold work for the second cold working step that we've subjected to the specimen. And then we might be tempted to say, well, then the total cold work 
that the sample has now been subjected to is just the sum of the original coal working from the manufacturer plus what we've now done to it for a total of 50 plus 50 or 100 percent cold work. However, if we step back and think about that for a moment, we'll realize that this is an absurd answer, makes no sense, since based on the definition of cold work, the only time that you could get 100% cold work is if the final deformed area went to zero. So it's clear that this is not the proper way to analyze this particular situation. And that's because cold work is not an additive property. Instead, what we would need to do is first determine what the original cross-sectional area was before the manufacturer had cold worked the sample. In other words, the original cold work, cold work 1, as we've called it, we know is 50%, and that this should represent the percentage reduction in cross-sectional area. So if we take the original cross-sectional area minus the cross-sectional area of 4 square millimeters, as we received it, divided by the original area, we can use this to determine the original cross-sectional area before the manufacturer cold worked it. And of course, we see that in this case, the original cross-sectional area must be 8 square millimeters. Finally then, we can take this original cross-sectional area and use that in order to calculate the total cold working of the specimen. So we take the original cross-sectional area of 8 square millimeters, subtract our target value that we'd like to cold work to, 2 square millimeters, and divide by the original, and we see that the total cold working in this case for the specimen would be 75% coal work. So then we might wonder, okay, what would be the yield strength and ductility for this 75% coal work sample? If we go back to the graphs and look for 75% coal work, what we notice is that the graphs actually end before we reach this point, and that's because long before we'd reached 75% cold work, the sample will have lost so much ductility and become so brittle that the sample fractured. So it, in fact, it's impossible to cold work this sample to 75%. So in a case like this, what we would find is that we need to anneal the sample before we can cold work it further. Although we're going to explore the concept of annealing in much more detail in a future lesson, at this point, it's just important to understand that annealing, which involves holding a sample at high temperatures for a fairly long time, effectively reverses or undoes the strain hardening of cold work, restoring the sample to effectively the properties it would have with 0% cold work and making the current area what we would now consider a naught for any further cold working calculations. Note that if we're interested in looking at the properties of the brass once it's fully annealed and returned to 0% cold work, we can take a look at the graphs. We'll note that at 0% cold work, the copper sample has a yield strength of only 160 megapascals, quite a bit lower, and a ductility of about 45% elongation, quite a bit more ductile. Finally, if we're now interested in cold working our annealed sample from a cross section of 4 square millimeters down to 2 square millimeters, we recognize that this is 50% cold work we've reduced the cross-sectional area by 50%, and then we'll notice that in terms of properties of yield strength and ductility, it just returns us back 
to the original values as we had received the sample from the new.